What's up guys, this is Griever back here bringing you guys the latest behind the bar reviews for chapter 317 of Seven Deadly Sins and as you guys can no doubt tell from my hype, I have been waiting. I have been waiting. I couldn't wait. I saw the Raws yesterday. I saw the Raws on Canada Day. Happy Canada Day to all you beautiful Canadians out there and I have been waiting for this chapter to be translated all damn day. I rushed home. I, I broke the speed limit. I did all the, that fun jazz. I delayed making supper. I delayed going out. And now I'm kind of hungry. But that's the point is that I waited. I waited, waited, waited. Each minute I was refreshing that page to see the scans, to see the translations for this chapter. Chapter 317. You guys all know my favorite character, Eskinor, since he was introduced. Him and Bond have been like this, this, teetering for me for a very long time. Two of my favorite characters, and we've had enough Bond moments. We've had our Bond moments, and I'm good with it. And even the last one was kind of Dus Ex Merlin. But this, this is pure. This is gold. This is the best chapter of the year. It's definitely the highlight since chapter 300's abysmal treatment of what the story was all going to lead up to. And as you guys all know, my hatred for chapter 300 is only is only dwarfed by my hatred of chapter, I believe it's 124 slash 125, where Deanne gets a second bout of memory loss only one arc later. But that is beside the point here, ladies and gentlemen. And this is going to be, as you guys can tell, a very long review because I got ranting to do. I got fanboying to do. I got panels to go through. I got dialogue to go through. And, I mean... Lion, lion, like I, as as you guys can no doubt tell. All right, first, first, first and foremost. Okay, so new volume featured, right? New volume is featured this chapter only because I just got my shipment in uh, yesterday. I got my shipment in, and I am now at least over half of Seven Deadly Sins collection complete as it currently stands. Uh, released, you know, Viz English, whatever. So, or not uh, Viz, it's uh, Code Dash uh, Comics, whatever. So, yeah, so that's awesome. So, I'm halfway through my collection of collecting Seven Deadly Sins as it currently stands. That's great. It's great to get ahead of the game. Now, the other thing, of course, my haircut. And I almost thought about shaving off this beard, but I didn't want to wait any longer to do the review because I wanted to feature mustache, short-haired Escanor as Griever would be. Griever, Escanor, we're like, we're like this. We're, we're good to go. And I mean, I mean, hell, let's, let's bring Kanegas up here. Let's, let's bring the mascot himself. You guys probably haven't seen this bad boy before. But yeah, let's bring my pet lion in to talk about being the lion sin of pride. Why don't we talk about that, Kanegis? Because clearly a lot of the people, especially on Grimm's Discord, a lot of people are telling me that, you know, Eskinor's not going to do shit, it doesn't matter, he's weak, he's not a character, his character development is trash. They've been telling me so much about that. So, so look me in the eye, look me in the eye and talk to me, good boy. So, what do you think about that? King. Yeah, you guys want to argue with a goddamn lion? Yeah, I didn't think so. So we're gonna leave. We're gonna leave him here for this review. So let's get into this, ladies and gentlemen, because Escanor, Escanor in this chapter. So cover page right off the bat. Now I praise Nakaba for doing the last cover page and the question um, doing world building and lore building, which was great. He doesn't do it so much this chapter, but once again, you don't need to do it every chapter. Just sprinkle it. Just salt and pepper that meat every time, a little bit, here, there, and everywhere. You don't salt and pepper everything. Not every ingredient needs it. You just you just do it for the first, for the entree, right? So anyway, we're moving on from this, and that, that cover page, when it talks about, you know, he stands alone, you know, he won't uh, allow himself to turn tail and run, the, the mark on his back won't allow it. So reminiscent of Whitebeard, and so reminiscent of the fact that you all are forgetting one thing. Everyone, I have heard a lot of people call Nighttime Escanor a coward. When has he actually ever been a coward? When? For comedic effect, of course, he's cried and gone, Oh, I can't possibly, ah, you know, and that kind of stuff, right? Comedic effect? Sure. Has he been terrified in his boots? Sure. But when did he ever actually run away? When did he ever abandon anybody? 
When did he ever not stand up and defend? He even... The, the Vazio fight. Let's look at, at the festival fight, right? Nighttime Escanor. Weak as hell. Two commandments looming over him. I'm, I'm not fighting my friend Gotha. I'm not doing it. Gotha attacks him. He's like... I'm still not fighting the dude. I'm not fighting him. He's one of my comrades. I refuse. He, in his coward, as you guys would call the cowardly way, it's not cowardice. I hate when people call Escanor a coward. Not a single scene in the anime or the manga has ever shown anything less than him being brave as hell, both in his pride form when he's powerful and when he's the weakest human in the series in nighttime. He's never been a coward. So let's just get that off the thing. The whole white beard thing, like he won't allow a mark on that back. There's a reason there's no mark on Escanor's back. You know the reason? Because he's never actually run away. So he's not a coward. Let's just get that off the bat. I told you guys, this would be a very long review. I, I feel like we're already 10 minutes in. Now, the rest of it. Okay, so we jump in and we're not going away from this. Of course we're not. We have, you know, Kokri sword, friggin' Hylian shield, Escanor, you know, ready to go, you know, twirling that blade, like, all right, let's go. And he, he doesn't say divine sword, Escanor, but he says, like, the sword of Escanor, you shall feel the wrath or something. And I'm sitting there like, Escanor, like, it, it's a little cheesy, but I'm like, you know what? I mean, nope, everybody took the man serious when it was daytime and he had sunshine. So I'm going to see what he's got. And did I expect anything? A little bit. I expected something, and don't get me wrong, we saw something, something very impressive in my mind. But I expected a little more out of Nighttime Escanor. I did not expect what happens later in the chapter to happen so soon. I thought we'd push that off to chapter 318. But here we see that he's like, he attacks, he's blown back, nope, that's not gonna happen sort of idea, and, it, and it's damaging. Then we see Gil Thunder, like, get up and try again, like, Lightning King Iron Armor, you know? It does shit to this baby Endura. And remember, these baby Endura are clearly very, very strong, uh, because King could have done so much. Deanne and Gothard, like, if they were so easy to eliminate, even Merlin should have been able to box them in and foam. Uh, like, we're seeing the superhumans, of course, do stuff, but for right now, from what we saw of Hexagonal Graveyard, these things are still quite powerful as far as we know their level to be. So Escanor being, as I said before, and I don't feel ashamed saying this, the weakest. He's got no power right now. Whether or not he has an original magical power, which I believe he may ha actually have, and I honestly believe he does. It's just not awakened or was suppressed by sunshine, blah, blah, blah. That's theory time. But the fact of the matter is right now, this is a 15 power level human. No magical power. He's not on the level of a holy knight. He doesn't even, like, there's nothing for him. And he's still standing doing this shit, right? So he attacks, as I said, Gil Thunder attacks, it does nothing. And then, you know, the the crazy baby Endora, such a stupid name. But the, uh, the alien wannabe reject, you know, shoots out a tongue trying to attack Gil Thunder, and Escanor's like, nope, shield. It pierces through the shield, pierces through him, so now the shield's even more cracked up. The shield constantly gets broken in this uh, in this chapter, and he's like, your opponent is me, and I'm like, the balls on this guy! The damn Lion King level balls! Good boy. The Lion King level balls on Escanor to be like, nope, sorry guy, you gotta go through me first. Even though he's getting his ass kicked. Like, it's not as prideful statements, but you still see it. You're still seeing that little bit of salt with this dude. And then everyone's like looking at him and they're like, okay, how are you even standing up? Like, we just got blown back once. You're taking insane injuries. You don't have our dur Like, I'm going to paraphrase here, right? You don't have our durability. You don't have any magical power. You don't have our training. You don't have most of everything that's making us actually lay on the ground and not dead yet, like R.I.P. Greenmore and Hauser right now, right? The only reason they're like that is because of their training and all that stuff and their power. Escanor has none of that. He's still standing and walking towards this thing. They're like, what? And then Escanor says something great. Now, I'm just going to bring it right up right now. The whole noontime thing, he also states this again uh, as, as his persona. He's calling his daytime form his noontime self. 
his prideful noontime self, it doesn't actually mean the one. Just so we're clear on that, both the flashback panel and the fact that he used it in two instances where it's kind of like, no, you weren't actually in the one during that, uh, you know, that that is a clear indication that he's not talking about that. I'm sure the comment section or people on Grimm's Discord will beat me to death with that information. And when the official translation comes out, everyone will forget that I was right. But nonetheless, that's the way I'm taking it. Now, Escanor goes on to say, have any of you ever actually taken a serious hit from the captain? Like, why are you bringing this up now? And he goes, well, here's the thing. I have. And it's like, he's like literally probably one of the only people to live and tell about it. Bond, potentially, and him. Who else actually ever took a serious hit and lived from, like, assault mode Meliodas, from, from prime Meliodas, right? He's like one of the only people, one of the only characters. I'm sure you guys can come up with other examples, but off the top of my head, that's all I'm thinking of. Is who else is surviving that shit? The immortal guy who literally can't die, and the dude who's tank enough to survive it. So, he says, like, you know, when I first, like, joined the Sins, and we see this flashback. So, this is not the battle where he fought Assault Mode Meliodas back in, um, I forget which volume it is, volume 29, volume 30, something like that, where he fought... Uh, the one, and we saw the reveal of the one for the first time inside the perfect cube, and Melios went all evil. This is when he was first being recruited. And I said this um, previously in other videos about how Eskinor probably didn't just join up because Merlin had a pretty face and Melios just asked him to. He was he probably was like, okay, what's the catch? And Melios was like, well, I'm the captain. Eskinor would be like, no. Mm -mm -mm -mm. No. Sorry. Like, I'm not going to take orders from those beneath me. That's very Escanor character, right? So they had a battle, and we see just this one panel, a flashback panel to prove it, that they had a battle. And we see this is clear indication, because Escanor's not in the one, he's not crazy super buff, but Meliodas is also in his original attire, he's got his demon mark, but he also has the broken hilt sword. So this was back in the day. This is when he went to recruit Escanor and he took, we don't know the outcome of the battle. I don't believe it's truly stated here. It's implied a little bit, but we don't know the true thing. The point of the fact is, is that he is telling Gil Thunder Hauser and Grimoire, I've taken a serious hit from this guy. And trust me, what I'm feeling right now, and look at Escanor's state right now. What he's feeling right now is kind of like, he's like, no, you, you do not know pain until you felt him attack you, you know? He goes, now granted, I, I felt it in my, as he says, noontime form, but what he meant was my daytime form, my powerful, prideful form. I felt it then, but that doesn't mean I didn't feel pain. That doesn't mean that I didn't feel the weight of that power behind that. And clearly, by this logic, once again, I believe it was probably a draw, but... Suffice it to say, even if it wasn't a draw, clearly Escanor recognized Meliodas' strength and was willing to say, okay. So maybe Escanor, before noontime, sat back and went, you've proven yourself worthy, I'll follow you for now until I think you're not, sort of idea. Or once again, maybe Merlin called it off and said, draw before the one happened. Because it would be very strange for Meliodas in, this, in the form 10 years ago, back in the past, to who wasn't out to kill Escanor, be weaker or not be able to, or be able to take on the one when Assault Mode Meliodas trying to kill everybody was not able to, right? I mean, you can make the argument that maybe he was more powerful, blah, 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 but I, I mean, that's so, the numbers game is so up in the air that I'm not even going to fathom that. All I can say is, is that I think it was probably a draw or it was suspended battle and, uh, you know, Eskinor just recognized the strength and said, yeah, okay, I can follow you for now, because he felt the pain. So that's the first, like, portion of the chapter. Then we jump, in my mind, there's, like, two acts to this chat, like, a three-part chapter here, and uh, we're going to jump into the second part right now. And here's why I wanted to split this into two parts. Of course, I can't show panels because this review has to stay on, and I am not risking that. That's why we're showcasing my boy Kanegas over here as our as our representation for every panel that Escanor is featured. But the fact of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, is that this is brutality. This is something dark. This is 
Okay, so this is the whole reason we're splitting this into two parts. Because we need to talk about the damage Escanor incurs here. This is the most brutal I think we've ever seen since... And I would like to say the thing more brutal than this or, or on the same level would be the whole Zaratros thing when you see his body and he's been stabbed by a thousand spears and swords and stuff. But the thing is, is that we don't see it happen. We, we're not witness to it. We see the body after the fact. This, we're witness... Like, if they go this far in the anime and they do a good job, this is going to be either censored to shit because it's that brutal or it's going to be gruesome and brutal. This is dark. This is, he's not, at first, when I first saw the leaked images, I thought he was like burnt or something, right? Like he had been thrown in fire or something, which is still, still awful. Still like, oh my, damn, Escanor. But no, it's because he's so damn bloody that everything looks black. That is, like, he tells everyone, like, don't worry, I'm going to be your shield. Let me be, like, the lion in a pride sort of idea. He's like, I, like, take this time to escape, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to, like, I'm going to go. This is not more than a bug. See, once again, Eskimo still has that pride in him. He's still the lion in a pride outside of his daytime form because he even says, outside of Meliodas, like, what this guy's doing, seriously, this is a bug bite to me. Now, what he means is, is that the pain he's feeling right now, his body is giving out. And he's not doing any damage to this baby Endora thing, right? His body's giving out, but his pride and his strength and his bravery is not. Because he's like, I've, I've experienced way worse than this. Like, like, oh, tis but a flesh wound. That is literally Eskinor's stance here. He loses an arm with a sword. Okay, let's go in with the next one with the shield. Boom, loses that. Boom, gets slashed all to pieces. Like, he gets sliced and diced. He's totally wrecked. Like, he is... And you see this gruesome image at the end where I'm just like... Like, you know, I had a feeling. You all... Everyone knew that Escanor was going to die. And here's the moment that I thought something else would happen. I didn't think the arrival of what happens happens, which is we're saving for part three of this review. But here, I was thinking, okay, something's going to happen. I didn't think Eskimo was going to die here. But still, the brutality, this is the most gruesome thing I think we've ever seen Nakaba show us panel by panel. I could be wrong, guys. You might think of something else below. I don't remember seeing like them tearing off the wings of the fairies for panel upon panel in the uh, in the Hellbrum backstory or something, which would also be very brutal. And I don't remember, like, uh, one of the other brutal things was, of course, uh, Rue or Ro, um, you know, with Jahar and stuff in the past Holy War arc and stuff, right? That was pretty brutal. But this, we are getting, like, half a chapter of someone being sliced and diced piece by piece. And not only that, one of our main characters and one of the fan favorite characters so there's a lot to talk about right there but the fact of the matter is it's his inner monologue that does it for me because he talks about this and I feel like it'll be better translated uh in the official release but in this translation he basically says like how pitiful of me like he's there getting like his arms chopped off and he's getting sliced and diced across his entire frame and he's saying this is such a shameful sight. Because remember, once again, pride. Not just because of sunshine. He is the lion of of pride. And he sits there and he goes, this is shameful. This is shit. This is not, like, how what a laughing stock I would be in front of my friends. Like, I can just imagine what, what their faces would look like sort of idea. Once again, I'm paraphrasing here, guys. But, and then he, like, thinks about it. And you see all the serious faces on everyone, on all the seven deadlines, on Gother, on Merlin, on Bon, on Deanne, on King, on, you know, and on Meliodas there. You thought it was going to be Merlin. Merlin's front and center with the whole line of panels. But there's Meliodas there, giving him the stare. Because once again, it's not, it's not brought up enough, and that's Nakaba's fault, not Eskinor's character's fault. But remember that Meliodas is just as important not in a love interest way, but Meliodas is almost, if not as important as Merlin to Eskinor. Out of every other character, Meliodas is the one who accepts him. Meliodas is the one that could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him, understand his strength, his sorrow, all that stuff. Meliodas is the one that, you know, 
he's his he like Bond and Meliodas have this friendship that we all wish we had, but Escanor views Meliodas in the same way as Bond views Meliodas as his savior, as his friend, as his you know everything. Uh, so it's great that he's he's showcasing the captain of his order. And what he's thinking right now is about how he looks as a knight. It's not about love and, and all that stuff right now. It's about his pride as a knight, his honor as a knight. And who's the leader of his order? Meliodas. And he looks there and beautiful shot and just a great line saying, no, that's wrong. Nobody is laughing at me. Nobody at all. It's like... Of course no one's laughing at Eskimo. None of these people would laugh at his attempt. Nobody would laugh at Eskimo right now. And and I I I'm actually I would get mad. I'm actually getting a little pissed off because I know there are people out there that are gonna call him a coward again, which I already explained at the beginning of this review. Eskimo is no goddamn coward. Eskimo is the epitome of what it means to be a knight of Britain. A True, honorable, chivalrous knight. He is the literal definition. You go to your Funkin' Wagnalls Encyclopedia. You go to Dictionary.com. You look up an image of a knight, you're going to see Escanor. And I don't give a shit if it's his pride form or his nighttime form. You'll see both images standing toe-to-toe -to -toe right beside each other. Because this dude, like, I, I just get really, as you guys can tell, I get agitated. I get agitated when I read the, the forms and the manga and the discords and all this stuff. And I hear all the hate for Nighttime Escanor because that's where people lose it in that he's just a one-dimensional muscle head character. When he has depth, Nakaba has failed to show it, but he has character development. He has depth. It's just that nobody, no, nobody cares about Escanor unless he's got sunshine. And that's just not fair to the character. I, I hate it, and I'm, I'm here to tote it. I'm here to do all that shit, to promote it, all the good stuff. So that all happens. He's basically like, all right, well, you know, at the end of the day, all I wanted to do, he continues to monologue, and he says, after he's basically done, he's got no arms. He's literally got no arms, and he cannot fight. And he's just like, if my greatest pride is being a member of the Seven Deadly Sins and stuff. And I love that they keep bringing up pride with nighttime Eskimo. Because once again, he is that, he's the sin of pride. And he's just like, if I had one wish, like I, in my final moments here, I wish I could stand beside them one more time. My pride is a knight. My pride is being a member of the Seven Deadly Sins. All that good stuff. He goes on to monologue. I'm not going to try to say it verbatim because it was just so good. Go read the chapter if you haven't. Of course you have, ladies and gentlemen. And then he just says, I am Escanor, lion to the pride of the seven deadly sins. And he faces death with a smile on his face. Cut up to shit, no arms, no power. So when we move now on to part three, and I know you guys might be getting sick of me already, but I told you this would be a long review because we need to talk about this. When we get on to part three, you'll understand why I needed to talk about this specifically here in this second segment of the review because it's going to be very relevant to all the haters that aren't going to agree with my assessment of what's going to go down in the chapters following. So Miles shows up, or man, or whatever. He shows up and he's invigorating stuff. He's blasting baby Endurers all to pieces. Everyone's super impressed. Apparently, Invigorate can reattach limbs and fix everything that was wrong with brutalized poor nighttime Eskinor. But the fact of the matter is, he shows up. He's like, Yeah, I heard your prayers, dude. I'm here. I am Mile of the Four Archangels. Here to answer your prayers, Sir Eskinor. But here's the catch I can help you with basically anything. I can help you with laundry, I can help you with cooking, I can help you with babysitting these three smokes. Not going to try to fight the Demon King. That's, as he puts it, if that's what you wanted me here for, that is an impossibility for me. That's what he says. And then he goes on to say, yes, it is shameful, pitiful, whatever, that one of the four archangels would say something like that, but that is just an indication on how powerful the Demon King is. And we're going to take these statements and we're going to roll with them in a minute. But, because I've re-recorded this like three times right now, and I keep getting too far off track. So, what does Eskimo say to this? 
Nah, don't worry about that, man. That's not what I want you here for. It's like, really? Then what? Uh, well, I want you to give me sunshine back. I told you I lent it to you. It's mine now. You know, that's not, of course, what Eskinor says. He asked them to lend it, but it's like, no, sunshine is currently lent Eskinor. You're saying, give me back what is mine. That's, you know, that, that the pride for the rest of the chapter has been a little bit forgotten here, but... I'm still good with this. So he's basically like, give me back Sunshine. You don't have to fight him. I'm good to go. I'll go take him on. I'm like, damn straight you will. What indication did we ever get that the one could not take on the Demon King? Not win. Not win. But take on. Because if Bond can do it, purgatory training and stuff, whatever. But if Bond can do it, then go with fisticuffs. Do you guys think that Bon would one-shot the one? As two of my favorite characters, I can honestly say no. Bond would probably lose to the one, in my opinion, even in his current state of power. So, for me, I just don't see why people think the one is so weak. The one has been shown to be literally the strongest character in the series as far as we've seen. If outside of, of course, yes, Demon King has shown some feats, but we've also seen him get tanked by a human with no immortality anymore. So, tip for tat a little bit, right? Now, here's here's the other thing: is that the rest of the chapter goes on, and he basically says, like, "I want Sunshine back," and Miles simply says, like, "Look." That's great and all, but you know you can't really do much against him. And he's like, no, but I, basically Escanor's opinion is like, nevertheless, like, I won't, basically Escanor's response is, and this is once again verbatim, guys, but it's, I won't basically know until I try. And it doesn't mean it won't be needless. It doesn't mean I can't do anything. I don't think, like, Escanor basically poses it in the same way I'm saying it. Like, I don't think I can outright go kill him, but it doesn't mean I can't do anything anything to him i still have a chance to damage him in some way right that's what's implied to me what did you guys read in that but that's basically it's like i won't know until i try and you haven't tried so you know that's basically what i hear now mile goes on to say basically yeah but your, your your body and stuff he's like oh don't worry about it it's fine you know i can still take it in sunshine i'm still good he's like that's not what i mean what i mean is is that your body right now is, and this is that last, and this is what I hate, guys, I really hate this, is because there is no, like, super in-depth explanation. It's cookie cutter, it's bare surface level, and this was the only disappointing part to me of the chapter, was the fact that they basically said, yeah, it's been sunshine killing you the whole time. There, there's no, there's no in-depth character building. There's no super complicated backstory as to how Sunshine saved him, but it's killing him, but it's saving him. Anything cool like that? No, it's just Sunshine. The theory everyone had when we first saw that ketchup come out of Escanor's mouth, that it's been Sunshine killing him the whole time. Once again, makes no goddamn sense how Mile knows that if you take this in once again, he says, he goes, your body, you should know it better than anyone. It is at its weakest point. Right now, if you take this and you fight one more time, you will most certainly die. Well, according to Ludashell, in multiple translations, Escanor's body should have already broken apart when he was a child. So, where did these goddesses get their facts from? That's all I'm saying. You can't trust... Everyone see, seems to trust Ludashell's word and the goddess's word. I'm not trusting them. Bunch of genocidal maniacs. I'm not trusting any of them. Honestly, not even Elizabeth at this point. Because none of them are right. Like, if Askinor dies, that's going to be the first time the goddesses were actually right. Because for one thing, the, that stupid goddess Horn could not have brought back Elaine. I can almost guarantee you that. So there was a lie. Uh, the goddesses lied about the whole, uh, uh, that whole trickery thing with Derriere's, uh, brother, sister, whatever, and the whole hostage situation. There was another lie. Then we have Ludashell, his entire life leading stigma is basically a lie, branded in, like, white paint sort of idea, you know, making it look good, you know, oh, holier than thou sort of mentality. And then we have Ludashell say, there's no way you have that grace. If, if a human takes in the grace, you, you, your body would be blown apart. You'd die. 
Well, Eskimos lived for like decades with this shit. Not only you, not only had it, used it. And now Mao comes down and basically says, and it's so convenient, isn't it? It's so convenient that he's finally starting to feel the effects just as the story happens. Like, uh, once again, Nakaba, you could have come up with something better. And I'm not saying that he won't troll us again and he won't say that, no, Ludashell and Mao, they were only half right. Here's the true story, you know? He could do that, but right now the surface level crap, I'm not trusting that. Not saying that Escanor using this, he might die. He might, okay. And that would be an epic way for the man to go out as the brave, bravest knight in the series would. But yeah, he still says, that's fine. Like, I don't care because I'm brave. You're like, once again, I'm paraphrasing, but Miles not. He's not willing to sacrifice himself. Miles is scared. Miles is scared of self-sacrifice. He's scared of the Demon King. He doesn't think he can win. He's basically Ichigo when he first ran into Kenpachi. He felt the spiritual pressure of the Demon King and gave up before he even tried. And then he couldn't even cut the dude. That is Miles. So, Miles fanboys who keep saying, oh, why would Eskinor be able to do anything when Miles doesn't think he can? It's because Miles freaking, uh, he's a pansy. He's scared. He doesn't think he can go up against him. He doesn't think he can win. So he won't even try. I guarantee you, Mile could do something against the Demon King. I'm not saying he couldn't. I'm saying he won't. It's not a question of can or can't. It's a question of will or won't. And Mile won't. He won't. He's not willing to bet his own life. He's a coward. Everyone talking about Nighttime Escanor being a coward in any panel. Mile is the biggest coward in the series because he won't even try. Went fist to cuffs one time at the Demon King, way past noon. Didn't even try Sunshine, granted the ruler and stuff, but still we saw him try stuff before. And then he sat back after realizing, oh, I can't do anything. And then he sat out the rest of the fight and just moped around. So, no, no. Point of fact is, is that he basically says, like, your body's going to die anyway. Eskador's like, it doesn't matter. I'm fine with it. The Seven Deadly Sins are giving their life for other people. It's time someone gave their lives for the seven deadly sins. And that's my job. I'm doing it. So, once again, paraphrasing, ladies and gentlemen. I keep saying that, but I just want to make sure that I'm not thinking that I'm quoting verbatim. So, fact of the matter is that he just says, yeah, give me, basically, give me my power back. And Mile holds out his hand. Eskimo's was like, oh, that was easy sort of idea. Hit that easy button because that was easy. Grabs it and he said, and Here's what I'm saying, right here. There's a question thing about, so Eskinar wrote poetry long before he met Marlon, that's fine, okay? Um, and that doesn't really give us much, but here he basically, he grabs his hand and says, there's still time before noon. He's like, yeah, I know, thanks. And then the last panel, crush! We see friggin' boom, 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 11 a.m., 11.30 a.m., Eskinar, He's got sunshine back. The sun will rise again. Praise that damn sun because he is going to do shit. Anybody who thinks otherwise is just a moron. I'm sorry if you're insulted, guys. Dislike it if you were. Don't care. Eskinor's a badass. Eskinor's the best. Eskinor is going to go kill some shit. Eskinor's going to go do some shit. This chapter was the best chapter of the year. This chapter was the best chapter. Chapter since we've got that abysmal 300. It's the best in all the 300s. And it showcases how much, like, Eskinor has character. People just don't see it. Because people only look at the brawn, not, not the nighttime. They don't look at that. You're all looking at him only solely when he was in daytime form. And saw a one-dimensional character. When he had so much more depth. So, shame on all of you guys. But the pride is back. The lion sin of pride. He's back, baby. So he's going to go kick some ass. We're, I'm excited for it. I can't wait to see it. And once again, just been toning this a long time. The The fact of the matter is, is that Mile, you know, just because he thinks an impossibility for him, he said nothing about the one form. He said nothing about the grace. He said that he doesn't think he can go up against the Demon King. It doesn't mean shit about what Escanor and the one can do. Stop using what Mild the Coward, the most cowardly archangel, the most cowardly character, is laying down on Eskinor, the bravest character. 
I'm not taking that as verbatim. I'm just, I'm just not. And y'all eat your own words when we see him in full form against that damn demon king. So that's the end of the review, guys. I know it was a super long one, but it's super hype. Like, comment, and subscribe. Battery's going to run out soon here. Like, comment, and subscribe. As always, this has been Grieger with your 7 Deadly Sins, Chapter 317 Review. Drink responsibly, as always, ladies and gentlemen. And we will see you back here next time. Peace out.